go to support him. A KO victory over John Brown would be a tremendous feather in Cotto's cap. A victory of any kind would be a useful credential as he moves forward. He's stepping up in class tonight against a guy who's physically tougher than the last person you saw him fight, Justin Juco, on the undercard of Brewer Morales. Let's go to Michael Buffer now for the official introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the Mandalay Bay of Las Vegas, the boxing action continues, courtesy of top rank and main events. The three judges for this bout will be Dwayne Ford, Jerry Roth, and Dalby Shirley. And when the bell rings, your referee in charge of the action, Kenny Bayless. And now 10 rounds of boxing. This is in the super lightweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black trimmed with white, officially weighing 138 pounds. His professional record, 28, pardon me, 23 victories, including 11 knockouts with nine losses and one no contest from Atlantic City, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, the Eastern Beast, John Brown. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the red corner, wearing blue with red and white. His official weight, 139 and one half pounds. His professional record, a perfect one, 11 bouts. 11 victories, including nine knockouts. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas y Caballeros from Cajuas, Puerto Rico, the undefeated Miguel Angel Cotto. Okay, unrobe, gentlemen, unrobe. No, 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 unrobe. Okay, gentlemen, any punches thrown in this area will be clean. Any punches here will be clean. Anything below, I will warn you on. Now, guys, we went over the rules in the dressing room. I want you to keep the fight clean at all times, protect yourself at all times, and what I say, you must obey. Touch gloves, and good luck to both of them. Felix Trinidad was already a title holder at the age of 21, Cotto's age. So... You never know in this game whether somebody is precocious enough to do that. But Cotto is a hope. Although I think, Jim, that the weight he's put on here tonight, uh, since the weigh-in yesterday, suggests that really he's going to settle in as a full welterweight. Stop, stop, stop. Time, time. Kenny Bayless already Mitchell, stopping please. the action. Go to neutral. And apparently John Brown entered the right, ring time in. without remembering time in. to bring a mouthpiece. So now Brown has a mouthpiece and the fight can begin at, at 34. After all his years in the ring and 32 professional fights, John Brown had to be reminded to wear a mouthpiece. That's when things start to get a little foggy there. <laughs> After all those fights. Two body punches, years. George. Cotto has a great left hook and tries to get to the body to set it up. John Brown has to work to the body because it's difficult for him to reach fighters' heads. And yeah, that's what you want to do if you're shorter, is to start jabbing to the body yourself to make your opponent bend his head down to your height so that you can use your jab. Make him throw his height away. There isn't much body on John Brown to shoot for. Brown's best punch is his sneaky right hand. He kind of trails it out to the right and then sticks it to your body. Cotto, when you see the left hook, you'll see the natural talent. This is the division that's ruled by the super strong Costa Zhu. Zhu is, is getting up in years, but still seen as clearly the dominant fighter at 140 pounds. And if Vernon Forrest should move up to the 154 pound class, as some people expect. The welterweight division will be open in a year or so if that's where Cotto is going. Well, for the time being, it's easy for Cotto to stay at 140 because he's fighting every month and never spends more than a week out of the gym. 
as he gets to bigger money fights and they are more widely spaced apart, it might become more difficult. D didn't he tell us, Jim, the last time we saw him that he weighed 140 when he was 12 years old? Yes. And he was married when he was 15 or 16. I mean, this is an exceptionally mature young man for his age. His life has forced him to be. Overhand right shot in there by Brown that time after being caught himself with a combination. Carter's got to decide how are you going to fight? Are you going to move Come around, on, box, or are you going to establish, look, this is my ring, and make his opponent, no matter the size, move away from him? He hasn't made that decision yet. That's that's perfect observation, George, because Cotto hasn't thrown many punches in this first round, seemingly not quite able to make up his mind yet what he wants to do with Brown. He can punch. Cotto. Hey! Oh, boy. Well, as we go to Cotto's corner, they do speak Spanish. So if you were frustrated at your inability to get Ray Torres before, you get him now. Okay, let's deep breath. That's okay. Take a deep breath. Yeah. Yeah. Nice and calm. Don't, don't throw too much of the head. He's so little, he's going to hurt your hands. Okay? Throw strong. Only when you can. Hey, move to the side. Yeah, don't step back. Yeah. When you're inside, you got to hit that body off of them slits. Both hands, both sides, then step around them, all right? Step away from the step, or step to your right. To your left. You know what I'm saying? Right. Jitter's going. Now you got to hit that body off of them slips, John. Yeah. Okay, don't pick okay, your head up. You got to keep touching with that jab. Keep touching. Copy box numbers in round one. Cotto 10 out of 46. Brown 4 out of 23. So they got to look at each other. Now let's see if they're ready to box. Very important for Brown if he's going to follow his man around. You got to touch him with something every now and then. So all this Carter is doing is just looking up, waiting for an opening. This undercard has uh, enabled the crowd to hold its breath for the main event. Put yeah, it that and, way. And you know, it's funny. I was just sitting here thinking, Cota can be this patient looking for opportunities against Brown in an undercard fight. But once he gets to main events, the audience will pressure him to start faster. Now he begins to open up a little more, seemingly feeling as though he's solving the puzzle of Brown a little bit. Work out, fellas. Work out. Brown had better stay real close, or if you're not, get far away. Good sharp right hand by Cotto. Cotto can hit too hard to just stand in front of in his range. After a first round that was so slow paced, Cotto seems to have decided that Brown's so conscious of his left hook. He's going to have to develop his right hand to open this fight up a little bit. So Cotto's thrown a series of right crosses across the top here in round two, thinking maybe that will get him at Brown more easily than the left hook. And the, cr and the crowd is getting restless. And there was a great hook to the body. Brown just cannot overcome the reach. Every time he mounts an attack, this guy hits him. Cotto does hit him when he's just getting started. When Brown comes straight in, he will... Bend his head down and, and bore in. And, and he makes you hit him on the top of the head, which is one of the ways that fighters hurt their hands. Shane Mosley in particular told me that he had to go to Brown's body because he was worried that he would hurt his hands hitting the top of that head all the time. <laughs> you got to do it. All your hand up tight. Just, oh. There's the left hook. Brown claims it was a slip. 
seven. Goto gets credit for Eight. a knockdown, and I think properly so. It was a proper knockdown, Five. but a cheap one. He was off balance, and he, he just got more shoved than punched down. I know it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Listen. Listen. Stop pulling off the shots, too. Stay tight off the shots. Don't pull off when you pull your head up in there. Stay tight inside. When you slip them shots, don't pull off them. Pull in where you can count inside to the body, right? right. You gotta also, you got to mix your jab in. He's floating right in your face. Right. Pop that jab out on him to keep him off balance when you're inside. He's right when you're close. He's right. All right, he's going to come in like crazy, so you watch, nice and calm. Yes, the uppercut is going to help you. Use that uppercut. He's going to fall down with it. Let's come on, let's, let's work the body. We're going to work the body. The knockdown. You can see it was a, a semi-stiff jab, and he just fell over backwards. Bad balance in that case. Give Cotto credit for the knockdown. Maybe that's a soft chin there also. Well, it's never we've never seen that before. But Cotto is the biggest man that John Brown has ever faced, George. Well, particularly having put on 13 and a half pounds since the weigh-in yesterday. I mean, at 153, your point about welterweight is entirely appropriate. Cotto is starting to open up. Brown has tasted that power. He's a little reluctant for good reasons. We talk sometimes, George, about how power comes from the legs. Cotto has strong legs in addition to everything else. In addition to everything else is correct. A couple of real stiff jabs from Cotto here. Oh, now he's starting to put his punches together in bunches. Starting down low and finishing on top. Left hook, caught Brown up by the ear. Three punch combination. Cotto increasingly gaining confidence here in round three. Brown seemed not to have any idea of what to do with this man. He gets close, doesn't throw a hook, doesn't throw a right hand. He just gets close and quick. Well, if fighting the super fast Shane Mosley was like trying to deal with a race car in there, now Brown is trying to deal with a truck. That's true, and, and it, it's awful that he has to follow a truck around and say, please, run over me some more. And that's exactly what he's doing. He stands there and waits to be hit. Brown does. Because John Brown has no chance unless he can somehow get inside and mix it up. That's his stock in trade. Get inside, get to the body, get inside the arm length of opposing fighters. But Cotto's punches are so sharp and so accurate that Brown is having an impossible time trying to do it. Finally landed two jabs, Brown did. Two jabs in the whole fight. Cotto has never stop, gone. Stop. Let him up, let him up. Ten rounds. Brown may be hoping that uh, after the middle of the fight that they'll be in a closer range and that Cotto won't have this much movement. But it's probably a forlorn hope. Farthest Cotto's ever gone was the seventh round Bye. against Juan Macias. He was able to knock out Chuco in the fifth back on June 22. Mandalay Bay Events Center filling up. Tremendous weekend here in Las Vegas. Every cab driver, every tourist on the street asking, talking about Deloy and Vargas. Crisp, clear night. And the two great Mexican-American 154-pound fighters in their dressing rooms preparing to get into the ring. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to let the public bother me. The public doesn't understand. This is a smart fight when fighting. Don't, don't look for anything. Everything will come to you. Beat that body. Beat that body. The theory used to be 
that you put on a good undercard so that folks came and had a good night at the fights. And if the main event didn't turn out to be the fight you'd hoped for, you still had a good night at the fights. I guess the theory tonight is the main event can't miss. And so none of this will matter an hour from now. Harold, how do you have it scored coming into the fourth? <laughs> okay, Jim, three to nothing, 30 to 26, Miguel Cotto. Jim, I gotta tell you something. Uh, the rules say that a round can't start unless the fighter's got a mouthpiece. Now, they got inspectors in the corner. You should have seen that. They ask each fighter to bring two mouthpieces to the arena. In case a guy gets a mouthpiece knocked out, it goes flying into the audience. He's got a second mouthpiece to put in when they call time during the lull in the action. So, Brown started the fight. You know, without a mouthpiece, that's against the rules. Give Cotto an extra point for the knockdown in round two. Cotto switched southpaw there momentarily, but led with the left hand anyway out of the southpaw stance. Now he goes back to his conventional stance. That's really good for Brown that Cotto would try something else at this point, as though he wasn't winning. It means some kind of frustration is starting to set in. I've hit him with my best shot. I haven't been able to hit him with my best shot. Something like that. Or maybe Cotto just wants to regularly make that a part of his game. He did it against Juco, too. When he did it against Juco, he did throw right jabs and fight like a southpaw. Let's see if he'll ultimately do that here. Larry always feels as though it's wrong for a fighter to go away from what he does best. Well, when you're winning, yes. And if you have the ability to change, yes, you should change. But not many fighters do. This kid has a lot of ability. Yeah. He's throwing punches to the shoulders. He's hitting this guy anywhere he can. He's not just aiming at the chin. Just using his greater strength. That's what he's doing. Maybe he just realized I'm fighting a little old man. We didn't hear all of the discussion in Cotto's corner because we were giving you that look at the strip and the area outside the Mandalay Bay, but it seemed that Cotto might have brought up the subject of the booze. And his trainer was saying, don't let that bother you. That was before the previous round. Um, you're fighting a smart fight, he said. Don't let, the public doesn't understand. Well, at this point in time, it probably doesn't matter, but you fight enough of those fights, and the public will understand they don't want to watch you. Brown shakes his head after the left hook to the body, and... George, we always know what that means, don't we? <laughs> that means that hurts. <laughs> oh, that didn't hurt. <laughs> Coda has got the package. Got the package. Doesn't overreach. Takes his time. Too much power for John Brown. In about 40 minutes from now, Fernando Vargas will leave that dressing room and walk toward the ring for what has to be seen as the biggest prize fight of his life. For years, ever since he left his amateur career behind, Vargas has wondered every day what it would be like to get Oscar De La Hoya into the ring. Tonight, he'll find out. Hey, the body is yours. Keep hitting him in the body. Careful with the, hitting him in the head. In combinations and the move around. Move, move around. Inside, that's what you come combinations. Hey, second champ. We got two seconds down. Second down. CompuBox numbers in the last two rounds show Cotto outlanding Brown 53 punches to 10. So now it becomes a question of for how long does Brown want to absorb this kind of punishment from Cotto? Brown has got all of the strength he needs, has everything, but he doesn't seem to know how to fight tonight. George, he's never fought anyone this big before, and he's just a scalp waiting to go on somebody's belt. That's why he got this fight. Somewhere down the road, there's a construction work career waiting for John Brown, who's done it all in construction, he told us. Flooring, roofing, insulation, electrical. Come on, he can't fight. 
He didn't learn flooring in the in the ring, Jim, because I don't think he's ever been knocked out. He's taken the best that Coda could give already, and he keeps coming on. Of course, he was knocked down a few rounds ago, but I don't remember ever seeing him seriously punished, except perhaps by Mosley. John Brown applied the first loss to the career of Peter Nieves back in 1991. He applied the first loss to the career of Lamar Murphy in 1993. He gave Robbie Peden of Australia his first loss in 2000. A couple of others. Doesn't look like he'll be able to pull it off tonight. That's a good tactic. Hit and hold. If you can't do anything, hit him and then hold him before he hits you back. That's what John Brown should do. That worked just then. It's so quiet in here, we could be in a gymnasium in San Juan. It won't be quiet a half hour from now. Your slips, John, don't pull off them. Drop under, you're catching the shots, turn yours back over to the body, right? And and look, when you step Yeah, exactly. And when you stepping around on them angles, look for shots over the top. When you pull them back too far, you can't see them counters. Okay. When you get your shots off sliding on the angles around the, around the shoulders, look for your right hands over the top. And you hook. Don't lower your guard and don't get careless. The, the defense has to be there. It's very important. Yeah. Hey, e easy. You got to throw that right hand and put some pressure on him. Jim, I've noticed a number of uh, fighters who come for this fight. Fighters who have nothing to gain or lose by the result like Evander Holyfield and Vernon Forrest etc uh, because they just want to see the fight but one fighter or perhaps ex fighter who isn't here is Felix Trinidad who had been scheduled to be here break break step back clean fellas come on and, step back, step uh, step at back. the last moment decided not to come apparently well just as Daniel Alisea lauded his fellow Puerto Rican Trinidad for the retirement. So to Mikel Cotto said to us yesterday, I hope he means it. I think he does mean it. And I'm proud for him if, in fact, he has retired. So Puerto Ricans are unanimous, at least the boxers we've spoken to, in supporting Trinidad for the decision to retire. You know, my guess is that if he came here even just as a fan, it would be interpreted to mean that he was looking to see if De La Hoya would win and have a big money fight with him and in fact De La Hoya told me yesterday that he thinks that Trinidad is just aiming for a better negotiation that would give him a better and bigger slice of the pie in a rematch. He could have a lucrative rematch against either Vargas or De La Hoya. He has beaten them both. Or he may just have a life. That's possible. That's, that's very possible. I'm just reporting what Delaware feels. Boxing experts are mixed in their opinions as to whether Trinidad really means the retirement or whether it's part of a business dispute about matchmaking. 
with his promoter, Don King. Or whether he is sincere about wanting to retire and simply may wake up one morning down the road and say, I feel like unretiring. Well, that happens. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> Didn't happen to you, did it, George? Never, 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 never. <laughs> It was all just a dream, right, George? <laughs> Bad dream. There's Goto going southpaw again. Stop, stop, stop. And Brown attacks him as if to say, okay, if you're going to turn southpaw on me, that'll make my right hand a factor in the fight. And Brown is starting to improve a little bit. One shot, he doesn't be, he's not able to uh, throw a combination, but he throws one, holes, one, hole. Well, it, you know, given that... The, the straight right to both the body and the head is probably Brown's best punch. I'm not sure Cotto helps himself by turning southpaw against him. No, it's definitely not a good idea. I don't know why he's doing it. But. What's the learning experience from this for Cotto, George? Well, you end up with a guy who's a world-class fighter in your weight class. You get him out, you don't let him shake you in the ladder rounds, and good things can happen. And you find out that some guys just won't be knocked out. Not in the early rounds. Well, the main event a half hour or so away, at least the walk to the ring a half hour or so away. Let's begin looking ahead further as we take a look at the man who will be the third man in the ring tonight, referee Joe Cortez. Some boxing experts, I believe George Foreman may still be in this category, regard Joe Cortez as the very best referee in the sport. And yeah, George, that, that, I rate him number one because he's never partial. He, he knows who he's exactly he's, he's in there for the, the best man win. And I've never seen him have a choice. That's number one. And he knows not to get in there and start trying to complain and penalize too early. Joe Cortez, you'll recall, he's the one who always says, I'm firm, but I'm fair. Tremendous experience. Tremendous experience with both Vargas and De La Hoya. Tremendous experience in noteworthy title fights. No big mistakes or mishaps which can be pointed to to compromise his reputation. Hard to imagine a better referee choice for tonight than Joe Cortez. Harold Letterman, how do you have this fight scored through six? <laughs> okay, Jim, I got it a shout out. Six to nothing, 60 to 53, Miguel Cotto. Jim, a couple things. Number one, in round six, Miguel Cotto changed his attack. He became the effective aggressor. Normally, you know, he was circling and, and you know, catching uh, John Brown on the way in with good left jabs and good left hooks. Back to the okay? And Okay, watch the head. Touch Brown catches brother. him with a good Give right brow. Go ahead. Right. Well, I had a question. When he, came, when he became the aggressor, at least twice in round six, John Brown came in with his head underneath Miguel Cotto's jaw, which really bothered Cotto. Another thing about changing southpaw, Jim, when he changes southpaw, he loses that snap to the jab because he can't snap a right jab. From the right-handed stance, he scores real well, as he saw there, because he can snap a left jab. Concur. I don't think the southpaw thing has helped him a bit here tonight. It didn't look that bad against Juco. Brown is a uh, black belt. Work out, work out, work out, fellas. So maybe he'll be using some other tactics as this fight moves to its final stage. You're referring to his height or his martial arts background? <laughs> <laughs> He's black belt high? Both. Cotto just trying to bust through the guard there. John Brown saying, okay, you want to use me to enhance a young fighter's resume, fine, but I'm not going to lay down for you. So given the way Brown's fighting, George, should Cotto just completely forget about thinking knockout and expect that he's going to bang his way to a 10-round decision here? Yeah, he's big enough now to just use an outstanding jab, get the best out of it. This guy's taking everything you got. Jab him, win every round, do it in a good fashion, go to the body to make certain he doesn't have power to hurt you in a lot of rounds. That's what he should be doing there. Just concede the knockout just may not happen. Toto oh, seems to be in exactly that back. frame of mind. He's unflappable in the ring, or has oh, been so stop, far stop, in, the back, in the, the brief back, period oh, of oh, his oh, professional oh, career oh, that we've seen. Expression never changes. That can be a scary time to be out there at seven rounds, a world-class fighter. You've given them your best, it can get pretty scary. Well, the instant this round comes to a close, Miguel Cotto will have fought further in a professional fight than ever before. Ah, uh, stop, stop! It's a 
it back. Here we go. Here we go. Keep it coming, fellas. Cotto now seems very apprehensive about Brown's head. Bang! So Cotto will go to the eighth round for the first time in his career. I know you didn't win, did you? No, I Suck up, good. Put your rock in your head. I want you to put a little more pressure on this boy now. All right? Listen, don't let him relax on the ropes like that. He get his shots off and he stabs you on the ropes and wait for you to do something and you don't do nothing. Step right to him with your combinations. Rock your head and hit that body good. And jab with something in front of you when you're going to him. Listen, John, off of your drops all night long. When this boy's punching, baby, 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 he stopped. You don't come right back off of it. You got to come. Okay, we got to work it just like you did. Now you're going to be the only one to knock him out. Not even Mosley knocked him out. You can do it. So go for it. He's got nothing left. He just wants to go the limit. So put your hands in there and make him count. Keep your hands up. But the, throw your hands. Throw them. Let's go. Let's do it. Well, there you have it. They're talking knockout in Cotto's corner, George. <laughs> As he gets ready to go to the eighth round for the first time. So they make clear they want that credential. Come on, watch the heads. Watch the heads. Watch the heads. Honest, it's accidental. Watch the heads, fellas. There we go. And, of course, Shane Mosley did score a TKO over John Brown, but the reference there is, well, he didn't put him on his back. He didn't, he didn't force him to be counted out. That's what you can do. Cotto has the power to do it. Oh, yeah. I totally agree with that. If you start wondering after eight rounds, you don't want to lose your juice for the tenth round. Uh, you can, know, I think he's such a mature back. kid. I, I just can't imagine this particular prospect getting hung up on the notion of having to knock John Brown out. Yeah, Seems it, to me he it, walks away from a decision just as happy. Yeah, he, he get hung up. Yeah? There are a lot of fears that come along with being uh, a no big, no good champion. Big star. Yeah? A lot of fears. You don't want to lose. And 10, 12 rounds. So I may be overrating that placid exterior of his, huh? Yeah, no doubt about it. He's got the power, though. If he, if he hasn't tried to get in there and beat this man to the body, go up and go down to, to search for a knockout. Oh, stop, stop, step back. Cotto seems to be content if this fight goes round after round at this point now. That's what I thought. I mean, it looks to me like he's so concerned about Brown's head and the possibility of getting butted that he's willing to just peck away from the outside and take the win. You're right, you're right, you're right. I, I didn't understand it. I'm sorry. That's exactly right. But he still has that left hook that he can just come up with out of nowhere. If Brown makes a mistake. Brown make the right mistake. He also has a couple of titanium rods in his right arm. The result of an automobile accident last year. Right. Might have the first titanium punch in boxing history. Golf clubs, tennis rackets have titanium in them to make them powerful. And he, in fact, said he thought his right hand might be a little bit better than it used to be since he got that titanium rod. Once again, we are in the uh, calm before the expected storm of the main event. And in the red, white, and blue trunks, you're watching rising Puerto Rican 140-pound prospect Miguel Cotto, Olympic star, big puncher. Who, who buckled the knees of Brown with a right hand, I believe, and has him hurt. Saved by the bell. <laughs> Great show. You clear? All right, let's quickly look at the three judges for the main event as we continue to uh, count down toward Vargas de la Hoya. And these are three judges whose experience in big fights is relatively limited compared to the kind of panels we normally see here. The best known of the three, 52-year-old Patricia Jarman, Manning of Nevada, veteran judge. Most notable decision goes all the way back to the second Holyfield bow fight in 1993. She was on the side of the winner. Paul Smith, a relative outsider, most notable decision. Burbick, Pinklin, Thomas, not all that notable. And a long time ago, this guy has very limited experience for somebody who is judging a fight of the magnitude of Vargas de la Hoya. 
And finally, Doug Tucker, 70 years old. Most notable decision again. That goes back nearly a decade. Tony against McCallum. Most recent title decision, relatively nondescript. Just like Smith, the other judge, an extremely unusual choice given his limited experience for a fight of this magnitude. According to Mark Radner, the head of the commission, there were so many objections to the elite judges, all of whom have judged various fights of Vargas's and De La Hoya's, that he decided to go in what he called uh, a non-controversial way by appointing officials he thought were competent if less well known. And frankly, if those judges were judging a fight like Lewis Rockman, you might say, well, so what? The fight isn't likely to go the distance anyway. But most ringside experts seem to believe that Vargas De La Hoya has an excellent chance to go the distance. The judges are going to really be important in the upcoming fight. And the referee, of course. A majority of ringside experts picking the winner of the fight in this morning's Las Vegas Review Journal picked De La Hoya by decision. 20 out of 21 picked De La Hoya most of them by decision. So the majority saying this fight's going to go the distance and the judges will decide it. Fascinating. Cotto is picking up the pace now. If he wanted to, he could really seek out a knockout. I think he wants it. Round 9 of a scheduled 10. He had Brown in trouble at the end of the 8th. Brown has regained his legs now. But Cotto is looking to set up some more big punches. Brown, who used to do survival training, is now in a survival mode with not a caterpillar in sight to eat. Boy, these rounds seem long, George. <laughs> you know, to show you something about size, it really has nothing to do with anything. Guys got hot, all he had to do is fight. That was John Brown's best right hand of the whole fight. As Cotto has gotten more offensive-minded, dropped his hands and left an opening for Brown to land one. Cotto turned southpaw. Again. And, and still continues to lead with the left hand out of his southpaw stance. Once again, prompts the question, what's the point? He's in with a pro with a lot of savvy. Brown knows when to fold and when to hold. <laughs> but as Larry pointed out, fighting to survive is John Brown now. Trying for the tiny moral victory of making young Cotto go 10 rounds. Hey! All right, quickly, let's profile the two trainers for the championship fight yet to come. And we'll begin in Oscar De La Hoya's corner, where the latest in the long succession of trainers to have handled Oscar De La Hoya's career is Floyd Mayweather Sr. Almost immediately upon hiring him, De La Hoya said, Floyd's the best trainer in the sport. Mayweather Sr. said, yes, I am. Of course I am. Uh, his, his reputation comes mostly from having trained his son, Floyd Mayweather Jr., and he says that Floyd Jr., now being trained by his uncle Roger, is progressing toward being an ordinary fighter. More on that in a moment. Meanwhile, Fernando Vargas is trained by Eduardo Garcia, who is as much a father figure as a trainer for Vargas. During training for this fight, they fired assistant trainer Roger Bloodworth, who was the man most responsible for Vargas's technical approach to boxing. But Vargas has made clear over the years if you have any competitive instinct, if you want to tilt with Garcia for turf or power in that camp, you're gone because Garcia, in effect, is, is Fernando's father. Uh, Lou Duva had his uh, step, step, exit a couple of years clean. ago. Also, when Vargas felt that he was trying to uh, over overtake Garcia. Eduardo Garcia. Harold, how do you have this fight through nine? Okay, Jim. Not a tough fight to score. Nine to nothing. 90 to 79. A monstrous 11-point lead for Miguel Cotto. Jim, the only thing 
that's difficult about this fight is is whether a round without a knockdown is 10-9 or 10-8 because Cotto's winning him so decisively. In the eighth round, when he staggered John Brown at the end of the round, I called it a 10-8 round. The rest of them 10-9 except the second where he gets an extra point for the knockdown. Harold, that's the most interesting thing that's happened in this fight. Cotto is giving it an effort. He is showing that after nine grueling rounds that he is still alive and trying his best. Nine knockouts in 11 fights going in. Two times he went the distance. Those were in four round fights. How important is it to a fighter at this stage of his career, George, to, to finish a 10 round fight? I think it's very important. That, that's the best thing that ever happened to him. He's gone 10 rounds. He knows exactly what he can do. He sees now that his power is still in existence. Hey, this is a win-win situation for Carter. Cotto. Miguel Cotto of Puerto Rico ended up the ladder fast in the 140-pound weight class. And as Larry Merchant pointed out, perhaps eventually to move to welterweight. Particularly a strong possibility in light of the fact that he weighed in at 139 and a half 27 hours ago and entered the ring at 153. But surely not the dynamic puncher that Felix Trinidad was. So we don't know how successful he can be at 147 yet. But at 140, he might be a force in another year or so when we'll see him against some stiffer competition. Not as sharp a puncher as Trinidad. Not as much lightning. Maybe as much thud. Well, Trinidad had the rare ability to turn around a fight with one punch against almost any opponent. Ten seconds to go. Looks as though survivor John Brown is going to survive this one. And Miguel Cotto is going to rack up an easy victory to stretch his career mark to 12 and 0. A winning performance but he didn't win over many fans here in Las Vegas. Muy bien. Muy bien la pelea, todo todo bien, el aire, todo. No se puede no quedar siempre. So on the night of the Mexican American Stars, Puerto Rican fighters go 1 and 1 on the undercard. Alisea, knockout loser to late to Nate Campbell. Miguel Cotto, and I'm anticipating the scores here, obviously. Easy winner over John Brown. This time I think I can safely guess that he has uh, won a decision in the fight. The beast of the East, John Brown absorbing, in all likelihood, the 10th loss of his career. <laughs> It's like being a pitcher with 20 losses. You got to be a fairly decent fighter to get into double figures losses in your career because you got to be around a while for that to happen. Got to be on the mound some. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the official particulars on this. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the Mandalay Bay, we go to the scorecards. Jerry Roth and Dalby Shirley. Both scored about 100 to 89. Dwayne Ford has it, 100 to 88. All for the winner by unanimous decision, still undefeated, Miguel Angel Colto. Final copy box numbers, a complete wipeout. Cotto landing 165 more punches, throwing. 231 more punches and doubling John Brown's connect percentage.